This meeting is being recorded. Hi everyone, my name is Janine. I'm the marketing rep for the Rothman Institute. And today we will be having a lecture given by Dr. Dan Davis, who's our shoulder and elbow surgeon. Um, he currently sees patients in, blue, in our Bluebell, Chalfont, and Willow Grove office. And he has surgical privileges at Abington Hospital, Jefferson Bluebell Surgery Center, and Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia. Um, okay, so Dr. Davis, take it away. Thank you. We thank you for having um, your presentation today. Yep. Thank you, Janine. Thanks for everyone for joining. Um, imagine most of you are here in the Philadelphia area with nice snowy weather outside. So what better thing to do than uh, talk about shoulders on our computers? Um, so my name is Dan Davis. Uh, I'm going to talk about just some common uh, shoulder uh, issues that I see and, and what different treatment options are for them. Uh, as Janine said, we can uh, answer some specific questions if you want uh, towards the end. Uh, there is a chat function if you just want to um, type in your questions as, as they kind of pop up and then we can uh, run through those towards the end. Um, and as Jean said, I, um, again, shoulder and elbow surgeon at the Rothman Institute, uh, and I work with um, at Thomas Jefferson, uh, operate at Abington Jefferson, as well as the Blue Bell Surgery Center. Oops, hold on a sec. All right, so just a little bit about my background. Um, I grew up in Pennsylvania, the Northeast part of the state. Um, kind of everyone here likes to just call it the Poconos, it's a good generalization. Uh, so, but when I was uh, towards the end of high school, I traded a view of the mountains for a view of the ocean and uh, moved to the Virgin Islands, which is actually where I graduated from high school. And then went from there to Wake Forest University in North Carolina and did my undergrad there. And then I did uh, graduate school and medical school at Tulane down in New Orleans. And then I um, came up here to Philadelphia for my residency at Jefferson, uh, stayed here for my fellowship as well in shoulder and elbow surgery. <clears throat> and then was hired uh, by uh, Rothman Institute, which is all the surgeons I trained with. And so now I'm up um, kind of north of the city in the Abington area, and again, seeing patients in Willow Grove, Bluebell, and Chalfont. Uh, and then in between all of that stuff, I managed to have uh, these cute little girls and my wife, Lindsay, who's a OBGYN um, in, at Christiana in Delaware, actually. All right, so uh, the things we're gonna talk about today, again, just kind of general common problems that we see for shoulder pain. Um, and really the most common uh, problem that we see are rotator cuff issues. Um, a lot of times people refer to that <clears throat> as bursitis, uh, similar kind of pathology, we'll run through that. Um, we'll talk about uh, biceps and labral type issues, uh, which is sometimes associated with instability of the shoulder. Uh, frozen shoulder is another common, um, diagnosis that we see, and then finally arthritis. And so we'll talk about kind of those pathologies as well as the treatment options for them. First, I want to start with going through uh, the normal anatomy of the shoulder. So this picture depicts where your shoulder joint sits. Um, you know, it's made of your humerus, which is your arm bone. And so that has the ball part of the ball and socket that you can see here. And then the socket we call the glenoid, and that's actually a part of your shoulder blade or your scapula. Um, and between those two, that make up the ball and socket joint of the shoulder. And the shoulder actually has a second joint in it called the AC joint or the acromioclavicular joint. That's where the acromion, which is another part of the shoulder blade, meets the clavicle or the collarbone. Uh, and then between those bony parts, there's a lot of soft tissue that helps hold the shoulder in place. You can notice that the socket's actually relatively flat compared to the ball. So a lot of the stability is dependent on that soft tissue and that end up, ends up causing a lot of the problems that we see. So the rotator cuff is one of the main stabilizers. We call that a dynamic stabilizer because it's dynamic, it's made of muscles. The rotator cuff is for muscles. They come from the shoulder blade and they attach onto the humerus here and they surround the whole humerus. Uh, we'll go into the injuries of those a little bit later. Your biceps muscle, has two tendons towards the shoulder. One is outside of the joint, but this one inside the joint can cause some problems that we'll talk about as well. And then the labrum uh, is deep inside the rotator cuff and the capsule attaches there. That's what we call the static stabilizers. And there are certainly issues that can happen there that can cause pain as well. So um, when you come in with uh, shoulder pain, for most patients, uh, the initial portion of the um, uh, office exam is gonna be pretty similar. So it's always taking a history, so finding out 
you know, how long the shoulder has bothered you? Was there an actual injury that caused it? Or is it something that uh, more came on over time? Um, <clears throat> where exactly does it hurt? Does it hurt deep within the shoulder? Does it hurt down along the side? Are there other associated symptoms? Pain that's radiating down your arm, numbness, tingling, neck pain, different things like these we go over and that kind of helps uh, guide where uh, the problems might be happening. And then we'll do a physical exam where we go through range of motion of the shoulder, strength testing, look at the skin, see if there's any bruising or any problems uh, with that. Uh, strength testing of the rotator cuff and the other muscles around the shoulder. And then certain special tests, which as I start to get an idea of uh, what's happening within the shoulder, there are certain exam maneuvers that we can try and not necessarily elicit pain, but reproduce the, the discomfort that you're feeling to, to hone in on what the diagnosis is. Um, most everyone's going to get x-rays just when you come into the office. We have x-rays in our office uh, building, so you're able to get the x-rays then, and then I can evaluate uh, the imaging at that time. And then we put all that together and kind of and come up with a diagnosis and then a treatment plan. Depending on what's happening, uh, I might want some more advanced imaging, or a lot of times people come in already with advanced imaging, be that an ultrasound or an MRI or a CT scan. Uh, so an MRI, this is an example picture of an MRI that you see on the left. And so what that is, it's called magnetic resonance imaging. And what it's really good at is looking at all the soft tissues around the shoulder. So x-rays look at bones, uh, but we can't see those structures that I talked about before, the rotator cuff, the labrum, the biceps tendon. So an MRI is very good at looking at that. Sometimes people can't get MRI, so an ultrasound is another option, uh, especially if you're looking at the rotator cuff, an ultrasound is a good option. Uh, CT scan then is, is kind of like a more in-depth x-ray. Uh, you can see some soft tissue structures in it, not quite with the clarity that you can on an MRI, uh, but it's really good for fine details of the bone, uh, especially if people have arthritis, which is what this CT scan on the right here is an example of you can start to get an idea of the bony morphology or if there are any major changes to the bone that has been caused by the arthritis. So once we come up with a diagnosis, then we need to come up with a treatment plan. Um, and these four uh, treatment uh, options are pretty much available for no matter what diagnosis you have, um, especially in the shoulder uh, and in orthopedics in general, most things are not, you know, we don't do life-saving work, we do life-altering work. So most people living with it is always an option. Managing the pain in different ways through activity modification or anti-inflammatories, if you know doing an operation or something like that isn't the best option for you, that's always the first option that we can do. Maybe coming up with some way that you can uh, change what you're doing with, the, with your lifestyle to be able to manage the pain and discomfort that you have. Physical therapy many times is another option especially in the shoulder, physical therapy can be quite helpful, and especially for rotator cuff problems, because like we looked at in those pictures between the shoulder blade and the humerus, um, there's a lot of movement in the shoulder joint, both between the scapula or the shoulder blade, as well as the actual glenohumeral, that ball and socket joint itself. And so many times those dynamics of how your shoulder sits and functions can get thrown off. And in this uh, Zoom world that we're living in, people working from home and doing these things all the time. I actually have been seeing a lot of patients who are complaining more shoulder pains because they're hunched over at their computers and doing different things like that that are, they've noticed are causing more problems with their shoulder. So those sorts of, again, modifying activities, but also maybe adding some physical therapy can be helpful um, <clears throat> uh, to help the shoulder feel better. Uh, cortisone injections are options for uh, different types of pathology, depending on what it is, kind of changes where the cortisone injection may go. Cortisone injections, cortisone is a strong anti-inflammatory. So it's not um, like an Advil, which is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. It's a steroid, uh, but the injection locally goes to where the pain is and sometimes can help decrease the inflammation that's causing the pain. And then surgery would be the final option if all of those other conservative or non-operative uh, measures have failed. Uh, or if it's something that really is life-altering injury, uh, an, an operation might be the best choice. So starting with the rotator cuff. So like we talked about before, the rotator cuff is a group of four muscles, uh, and they start on the shoulder blade. So this is the front of the shoulder blade. This muscle is called the subscapularis. Then on the top, you have a muscle called the supraspinatus. That tends to be the most commonly injured uh, rotator cuff tendon. 
and then in the back two muscles, the infraspinatus and the teres minor. And so they, the reason it's called the rotator cuff is their tendons attach on the humerus and surround it all the way in a cuff type fashion. So like I said before, it is probably the most common complaint that we see, uh, or pathology of the rotator cuff is the most common complaint that we see. And it's something that increases with age. Many times people come in and say, I can't have a rotator cuff injury. I'm not a baseball player. I'm, I'm an athlete. Uh, there's a common misconception that rotator cuff injuries are more common in athletes which really isn't the case, they tend to be more degenerative injuries. So it's more of a wear and tear type phenomenon where uh, just a lifetime of using your shoulder and doing different things, the tendon, uh, I always describe it like a rope that is getting used a lot and slowly uh, fraying. Um, and so the injuries in the rotator cuff that we see really increase with age. So based off some big studies that have been done, uh, people in their 60s, about 25% have some type of pathology in the rotator cuff. By the time you get into your 70s, 80s, um, it's up to 50%, sometimes even more, depending on what study you look at. And like I said, it's a mix of an injury versus a wear and tear pathology. So, um, and sometimes, you know, you have that wear and tear, maybe you had a little problem with the rotator cuff, and then you have an injury that kind of tears it the rest of the way. Uh, some other factors that come into play, family history has been correlated with rotator cuff injuries, trauma. So again, if you do have an injury, or heavy labor. People who are really rough on their shoulders on a day-to-day -day basis uh, tend to be a little more, uh, have more prevalence of rotator cuff injury. So a rotator cuff tear is when that tendon that's attached to the bone actually tears. Uh, in this picture, you can see it, it depicts kind of tearing okay. through the substance of the tendon. That's actually less common than that happens. Uh, it usually tears directly off the bone when it does happen. Uh, and the supraspinatus, so this muscle, the tendon that's up top, is the most common one to have happen. You know, why that is, is something we're always trying to understand. There used to be a theory of impingement, which you'll hear people talk about impingement syndrome. And with that, the theory of that is that these bones up top, this acromion, as you raise your arm up, pinches between, the rotator cuff pinches between that acromion and the humerus, and it can cause a tear. We think that does have uh, some role in it, but a lot of it ends up being more intrinsic problems of the tendon, meaning as we get older, the tendon quality uh, decreases. And so that might be more why it tears, but it's certainly some combination of those uh, factors. And then we talk about a rotator cuff tear. Many times I'll have patients come in with an MRI worried that the MRI says that they have a tear. And an important thing to note is that a lot of times it says partial tear. And this is the sort of thing where if we took an MRI of everybody in the United States in their 60s, about 50% of the people uh, would probably have a partial tear on an MRI. And maybe only half of those people would even have symptoms in the shoulder. So that's just a, an MRI is a very sensitive test that can pick up these things and can see these little inconsistencies of the tendon. And as I said before, the tendon does degenerate with time. And those are the things that the MRI can pick up. Um, and so it's really only that it's symptomatic that we start to worry about it or, or talk about different treatment. And there are things called high-grade partial tears. So when we talk about full thickness or partial, we're talking about the width, so the top to bottom uh, thickness of the tendon. A partial tear is only a little bit. A full thickness goes all the way through. Full thickness tears are the ones that we do start to get more worried about. Those are the ones that can really affect your function, cause a lot of pain, maybe not get better with conservative measures. Um, and then there's a, a concept that we think about a lot now called tear progression. And so that's a concept that if you have a small tear, a high grade partial tear or a small full thickness tear, the likelihood of that getting bigger with time is pretty good. Now, we're not very good at predicting how quickly that will happen, uh, but we do know that it happens with time. One of the factors that we know that, that we see is that um, patients tend to have an increase in pain if the tear size does get bigger. So full thickness tear doesn't automatically mean that you need an operation, but it definitely means that you need to be cognizant of your shoulder and keeping an eye on it, especially if it becomes asymptomatic, that if you start to have new symptoms, uh, the likelihood that that tear is getting bigger is pretty high. Um, and so that's something that we talk about whenever I see patients in the office with a rotator cuff tear. So what kind of symptoms do you usually have with it? Um, a lot of times people will describe this pain that radiates down the arm rather than in the shoulder itself. And that's really common. The pain actually 
uh, radiates underneath that deltoid versus so the deltoid is this big muscle on the side of your shoulder and the rotator cuff is right underneath that. <clears throat> and so it's very common for that pain to occur more down the arm rather than deep inside the shoulder itself. Raising the arm overhead tends to cause a lot of problems. Again, that's kind of that impingement type theory that we talk about, which causes the pain. And then also weakness. There's certain special tests that I can do to kind of isolate the muscles of the rotator cuff. And if you don't have all those tendons attached and, and creating that stability of the joint, you have weakness of being able to keep your arm in certain positions. And so those will be things that we look for on the physical exam. So treatment, as I said, usually starting with conservative measures is the way to go. Um, activity modification, anti-inflammatories, like we talked about, physical therapy, especially for rotator cuff injuries can be very helpful. Even if you have, like we said, a small tear, working on strengthening and coordination of the rest of the rotator cuff muscles and the other muscles around your shoulder and your shoulder blade can really help to decrease the pain and give you better function in the shoulder. If you go through all that, however, and you're really not getting any better, um, especially for a full thickness tear, a smaller full thickness tear, if people aren't getting better and they're still symptomatic within six weeks, that tends to be the time that we start to talk about surgical treatment. Um, for me, for a rotator cuff tear, almost always that means an arthroscopic treatment for it. Very rarely do I ever have to do anything open where you make a bigger incision. So we make small incisions about a centimeter or so, uh, a few of them around the shoulder. We go in with a camera and small instruments, and then we put these little anchors in the bone, which you can see here, and these have uh, sutures attached to them. The suture gets passed through the tendon and then tied down. And what that does is it brings the tendon down to the bone and compresses it against the bone. A lot of you probably know people who've had rotator cuff surgery if you haven't had it yourself. Um, and you'll know that it's a long, difficult recovery. And that's definitely true. I tell every patient that when they sign up for an operation. And I always say I'm not trying to sugarcoat it because you gotta know what you're going through. The reason it's so long is once we repair that, that tendon actually has to grow back into the bone to get its full strength. And to get the, the, the most strength that you get of that tendon bone interface, so we call it, takes actually three months. So we really limit motion um, for that three month period. Not completely, <clears throat> but the first four to six weeks you are in a sling and just resting the shoulder and allowing that to heal. After that time, you generally get stiff and then so you have to work through therapy to slowly get your motion back. So you work through passive range of motion, so stretching exercises. And then after three months, we start to work on strengthening and doing the type of therapy that maybe you would have done beforehand to get the rotator cuff strengthened again and coordinated again to working well. Um, you'll many times hear people talking about having a bone spur shaved down. That's something called necromioplasty. That is, I don't do that very frequently. The literature has borne out that that is not very helpful to do. It doesn't really change the outcome of the rotator cuff repair operation. Um, so it's something that might get added in uh, if you do really have a true big bone spur, or sometimes people will talk about excising the distal clavicle, distal clavicle excision. If you have some arthritis in that AC joint that can be symptomatic and correlate and with a rotator cuff um, tear, then sometimes that might be done too. It's all, it, it's sometimes dependent on each different person. All right, uh, moving on to instability. <clears throat> so there's a couple types of instability. Uh, one of the uh, one of them, traumatic instability, so where the shoulder actually comes out of socket. So that's where somebody dislocates their shoulder. Usually when that happens, the ball comes out the front. So it's, you have the ball kind of sitting down here outside of the socket. Every time that that happens, you tear your labrum because it's impossible to get the shoulder out of the socket without tearing the labrum. That does not mean, however, that every time that happens, you need an operation <clears throat> to fix that labrum. Um, it's a little bit different depending on age. So the athletic population, people in their teens, early 20s, those people generally were getting a little more aggressive with treating those initially or after the first dislocation or definitely after the second dislocation of an operation for doing that. The, um, the reason is we found that not operating on these people, especially after they dislocate twice, their chance of recurrent dislocation or dislocating again becomes very high. Uh, the older that we get, <clears throat> the less likely uh, recurrent instability is. So if somebody dislocates their shoulder in their 50s, the chance of it re-dislocating are not quite as high as those people in their 20s. Um, so it doesn't always mean you have an operation. 
Now that being said, the, and there is an associated injury of a rotator cuff tear that's definitely more common the older that we are. And again, that kind of goes back to just that tendon not being as strong as we get older. And so when you dislocate the shoulder, the tendon sometimes can tear too. And that might be a reason for having an operation after a dislocation um, rather than fixing the labrum. There's a, the, another concept uh, we call micro instability can be associated with a tear more at, at the top of the labrum or towards the back, which is something called we call recurrent posterior instability. And that's a problem that can cause pain deep in the shoulder. We see that a lot in people who are, uh, currently are or used to be overhead athletes. And it's caused by this biceps tendon pulling on the labrum. You can see it right here and causing this tear towards the top of the labrum that sometimes can spread towards the back. So you'll hear this term slap tear. And that stands for superior, meaning the top of the labrum. And then anterior to posterior, meaning it can spread to the front or the back. And it can cause a lot of problems. And the reason being is that labrum, that bumper is supposed to hold the ball centered in the socket. And if it's torn or stretched out, sometimes you have this micro instability where the ball is not staying centered in the socket, which can cause pain. Uh, it's usually a deep throbbing pain in the shoulder. Sometimes people will describe the feeling of a dead arm, or if they hold their arm up for too long and they start to get numbness, tingling going down the arm. But a lot of times, again, pain deep within the shoulder, it's a little different than that pain on the side that we see many times with rotator cuff injuries. Um, reaching out overhead, throwing a ball, things like that are symptoms that cause problems to patients that have this type of injury. Um, so again, therapy for this can be very helpful. About 85% of people that have these types of injuries can be treated really well with therapy, really focusing on uh, shoulder blade stabilization, scapular stabilization exercises, the reason being, is, again, the glenoid or that socket is part of your shoulder blade. And so having it in a good position then helps having the ball and socket joint in a good position. Um, and, it, and then again, if that does fail, or if you still continue to be symptomatic, and uh, there are operations for this, either fixing the labrum, uh, which is where you actually put little anchors in around that socket or that glenoid, and sutures around the labrum to bring it back down to the bone is an option. Another option that, um, believe it or not, doing something called a biceps tenodesis and not fixing the labrum has been found to be very helpful for this. And that's where, you remember these pictures before, that biceps tendon came all the way around and attached to the top of the labrum. We can do something where we just attach the biceps tendon in the groove here and then take out the portion of the tendon in between. So you don't lose any strength or any problems with your biceps tendon here, but what you keep or what you take away is the ability for that tendon to be pulling on the labrum and causing pain. And um, the advantage of that is a labral repair tends to cause stiffness in the joint that can sometimes be hard to overcome, especially the older that we get and the less pliable our tissues are. And so if we do something that's a non-tightening operation, uh, a lot we can do, have you get back to your normal range of motion and not have as much pain. All right, so frozen shoulder. Uh, this is another common uh, pathology that we see. Um, <clears throat> the scientific name, adhesive capsulitis. So many times we call it idiopathic adhesive capsulitis, which uh, as one of my mentors would always tell patients, that means we're idiots. We don't know what causes it. We can't figure it out. Um, but, and that's the most common type that we see. Uh, traumatic is another option where you have an injury to the shoulder. Uh, you hold it in a sling for a period of time, and then by nature, the shoulder gets stiff um, just by being held tight. That's a little different than the pathology that happens in the idiopathic adhesive capsulitis. So that more classic type, um, we generally describe in three phases, the painful phase, the frozen phase, and the thawing out phase. The good news about uh, frozen shoulder is the vast majority of patients get better without any operation and just conservative management. The bad news is it takes a really long time, many, many months, sometimes up to a year. Um, as you see at the bottom here, it's more common in patients who have a, a history of diabetes or thyroid disorder. Uh, and the reason we think that is, is there's an autoimmune component to those diseases. And we think that there's an autoimmune component to people who develop idiopathic adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder. That being said, it's not exclusive to patients that have those sort of diagnoses. And the concept is that you can see here this capsule. So we haven't seen this on other pictures, but underneath here is the labrum. The capsule are all the ligaments that go around the shoulder that help hold it in place. 
And you can see in a normal shoulder, the capsule is actually kind of loose and it kind of hangs down like this, which you can see pretty well on MRIs. Um, <clears throat> and that affords uh, the glenohumeral joint to have so much range of motion, it has the most range of motion of any joint in the body. There's a lining of this capsule called uh, the synovial lining. Every joint capsule has a synovial lining. And for some reason, and sometimes it can just be an injury, a mild injury that people don't even recognize happened. Uh, and that lining, that, that synovium gets inflamed. We call that a synovitis. And then people, very common story that people wake up in the middle of the night or wake up in the morning and just say that their shoulders kill them. And it takes them to the ER or they're just doing, they can't use the arm at all and it's so painful. Um, many times that pain will slowly subside over a few days to a couple of weeks, but then afterwards they'll notice that they can't really move their shoulder around. They don't have as much pain at rest anymore, but if they try and move, it just doesn't want to go. It's very stiff and it's very painful when you try and take it into positions where it doesn't want to go. You get a lot of pain at night because a lot of people try and, you know, when they sleep, they put their arms up over their head. They get in a position where the shoulder feels pretty stiff and doesn't want to go and causes a lot of pain. It's a very common story for a frozen shoulder. Um, so that painful phase is that more acute synovitic um, time period, which can be a couple weeks to a month. Then it develops into this frozen phase where those ligaments are just really tight and don't want to move. That one can last many, many months. It's been described four to eight months sometimes. Uh, that's the most frustrating part to deal with because the best option, the best treatment for it at that point is just to work on very gentle stretching of the shoulder and then give the, the, the pathology time just to work itself out. Um, sometimes if I see people early in the process when they have that more acute painful phase, we will try a cortisone injection into the joint to kind of calm down that synovitis and it can help with the pain and help people to be able to do stretches a little more easily so that they can kind of get back to normal range of motion. And then you get into that thawing out phase where things slowly start to stretch out and get back to their normal motion. Um, <clears throat> so again, you can see here are pictures of somebody with frozen shoulder. And so the definition of it is loss of range of motion in all three planes and that's forward elevation. So his left arm here goes all the way up, the right arm doesn't want to. External rotation, you can see the left arm here rotates almost out to the side, the right one almost stays right in front of him. And internal rotation, and again, his left arm can come up his back, his right arm can only go about to his buttock or side. Um, again, therapy is the mainstay of treatment. Some people have good success with physical therapy for this. I don't always recommend it for my patients. I, can, I sometimes find that for this pathology, if you really push it really hard, it's only going to be like a vicious cycle and just cause more problems. Uh, and I find that sometimes if you have somebody else doing that, it's harder to control and you can kind of irritate things more. So a lot of times I will just give you home stretching exercises to work on. I'll recommend you get something, uh, this over the door pulley that really helps to be, use your good arm to help stretch the bad arm up and just giving it time and being patient. And again, many times we'll get, people will get through uh, without having to have an operation. Uh, and then on the rare occurrences that this doesn't get better, there is an operation for it uh, where we can go in arthroscopically and basically release that capsule. So that really tight capsule, we can, we can bite it out. We have a little arthroscopic biter and you bite out a little piece that goes all the way around and it loosens that up. And then you start physical therapy immediately the next day to keep all the range of motion that we get back. But again, that's pretty rare that we have to do that. All right, and then finally, uh, we'll talk about arthritis of the shoulder. Um, <clears throat> the shoulder's interesting in that it has um, two different types of arthritis. You know, in general, you talk about osteoarthritis, which is the typical wear and tear arthritis. And then there are also inflammatory arthropathies like rheumatoid arthritis that affect all the joints in our bodies uh, at different rates. Uh, and then the shoulder's kind of unique in that it has a different type of arthritis that can be caused by having a rotator cuff tear and if you have a chronic rotator cuff tear, you don't have that stability in the shoulder and the shoulder's kind of bouncing up and down all the time, that wears and tears on the, on the cartilage and can cause arthritis. And we call that rotator cuff arthropathy. And the reason it's important to differentiate between those two is that the, if there's a surgical treatment for it, they're a little different uh, in terms of the different types of replacements that we have. Um, but shoulder arthritis is common. A lot of people don't really recognize it. Um, as much as hip and knee arthritis, and 
the large reason for that is we're not walking around on our arms. Um, so, you know, people are walking around, your hips, your knees bother you a lot more. Shoulder problems, you know, if you can't reach up to the high shelf, sometimes people just don't reach up to the high shelf and so it doesn't bother them quite as much. Um, but as people are being more active, uh, they're starting to notice, you know, if they want to play tennis or do different things that maybe the shoulder is bothering them more than they realized. And so it's about 30% of people over the age of 60 have uh, some type of shoulder arthritis. And so arthritis, again, to kind of go into some detail of it, the cartilage, uh, this is a chicken bone, but if you ever look at the end of it, cartilage is this smooth white stuff that covers the ends of our bones at the joints and allows them to move smoothly and in a pain-free fashion because cartilage has no nerve ends. Arthritis is a disease of the cartilage where the cartilage actually starts to thin out and then the bone underneath starts to have more wear and tear and feel more of the force going through the joint and bone does have nerve endings and then so it starts to hurt and then bone is also not smooth like cartilage so you start to get this grinding or popping and clicking. I'll often describe it as cartilage is like having two pieces of ice move against one another and then once you have arthritis and you have the bone underneath, it's like having two cobblestones treats trying to move against each other. It gets a lot of popping and clicking and doesn't want to move real smoothly. Um, and again, osteoarthritis, wear and tear. Uh, and there's also a component, a genetic component to this as well. Um, so going into osteoarthritis, this is an x-ray shown in typical osteoarthritis, pretty advanced. Um, there's a decent amount of bone loss here and you can see there's absolutely no uh, joint space there. Um, and the classic findings are stiffness and pain. So people can't move the shoulder around. It almost examines like a frozen shoulder and that's where an x-ray comes in to differentiate between the two. They'll feel popping, clicking, grinding, and they'll get pain with those motions as well. Uh, and it's really those two sorts of things, the, the functional loss as well as the pain that drives the treatment options. So non-operative, again, activity modification, anti-inflammatories. Cortisone injections can be helpful. Uh, sometimes under an ultrasound uh, guidance, this is a subacromial injection, which is not where it would go for arthritis. It would actually go into the joint here. Many times I'll do this in the office without an ultrasound, pretty comfortable about getting the needle into the joint. Sometimes uh, if patients have really bad arthritis and the joint's really tight, doing it under an ultrasound uh, can be more helpful if we want to try and get it in that spot. Often get the question of how often can I get cortisone injections? Um, and that's kind of different depending on the patient. Um, and usually what I tell people is if you're getting an injection once a year, once every other year, that's not a problem. You can continue to do that as long as it's helping and making you feel good. Uh, the thing that we worry about cortisone is repetitive cortisone injections can have a wearing out effect on the cartilage and potentially the tendon of the rotator cuff too. So if it's something where you get a cortisone injection and it lasts three months, you get another cortisone injection in the last three months and you keep coming in every three months, that's gonna be the point where we say like, you know, I, I think we need to come up with a better option here to help the shoulder rather than these repetitive cortisone injections. But if you're doing it, like I said, once a year, even twice a year is, is reasonable, but if it starts to get more frequent than that, then we need to talk about some other options. And so then the operative treatment, especially for advanced arthritis is a shoulder replacement, which you see a picture of here. Um, for less advanced arthritis, there is an arthroscopic option, uh, which, called, which is called a debridement or a cleaning out, a term I don't always like to use. But basically, that's where we can shave down any loose areas of cartilage. You can, that biceps tendon with arthritis tends to get tendonitis in it. So we do that biceps tenodesis and then clean up any frayed tissue with the labrum, which is always degenerative in arthritis too. Uh, again, for very early symptoms, if that's a real problem, that's been described to be helpful, but it'll maybe get you four or five years. So it's something that if we see somebody who's young, like in their 40s or 50, early 50s that has some mild arthritis that's really symptomatic, that might be able to get them another five years or so before they have to maybe consider shoulder replacement. And so a shoulder, this is an example of one type of shoulder replacement uh, where we replace the, the ball with a metal ball and the socket gets replaced with this plastic socket. There are many different types of shoulder replacements. Uh, as I said before, uh, shoulder, you know, shoulder arthritis is common and the treatment for it is becoming more common. So there are a lot of different companies that are making different types of shoulder implants. And so you'll hear things like stemless and short stem uh, and all these different things. And the best answer of what type to get 
is the one that your surgeon is most comfortable with. And so this is an example of a stemless um, shoulder replacement that I will use sometimes. And the advantage of this is we're not taking off as much bone. We're not putting a stem down, which, is, which takes away bone from this area too. Um, and then again, the, the socket is resurfaced with a plastic socket. Okay, rotator cuff arthropathy. So again, this is arthritis caused by a torn rotator cuff. And something you might notice on this x-ray from all these other pictures that we've seen, that ball usually should be centered in this socket right here. But you can see it is higher on the socket than it should be. And it's actually touching this bone, the acromion. And the reason is, is because there's no rotator cuff there. So again, the rotator cuff usually lived right in that spot between the ball and that acromion. But when it tears, this big deltoid muscle on the side takes over and pulls it up and, and that constant rocking motion starts to cause arthritis. And so many times people be very weak because they won't have the stability in the shoulder to raise their arm up. They have a lot of pain as it be, starts to become arthritic. And again, uh, abil inability to perform just things you need to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And so again, this is a little different treatment option, uh, something called a reverse shoulder replacement. And the reason it's called a reverse is you'll see here, the ball, instead of replacing a ball with a ball, we actually put the ball on the socket side. And a stem, we do have now short stem options of this. Some companies are doing even stemless ones too, but either way, a socket goes on the arm side. And what this does is it provides a more stable fulcrum for the shoulder to be able to raise the arm up without having a rotator cuff. This is something that's been, the, the more kind of modern uh, reverse shoulder implants were developed actually in France in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, and because of a lot of problems that were had in the United States back in the 60s and 70s with people trying very similar uh, types of replacements, the FDA was very um, uh, averse to approving these implants in the United States because they had had a kind of a bad history uh, decades ago. Uh, but these, the new design has now had a pretty long track record. Some, uh, some studies have them at 15 years of 90% uh, still doing well without any sort of revision operation. And so we have a pretty good understanding of the biomechanics and how to make these work better. Uh, they've been approved in the United States since 2004. So we have a pretty long history now, about 16 years of using these in the United States. And it's a really good option. It was, a, again, initially designed for patients with um, this rotator cuff arthropathy, but their indications or reasons for using them has really expanded. Uh, and it's really helped us treat some real complex shoulder problems that we didn't have a great answer for, uh, including fractures um, before these were developed. This is just, again, a picture of the type of implant that you can be used for a reverse. And again, there are many different types that are used. So in summary, um, there are many causes for shoulder pain. Um, again, the office visit with the history and physical uh, many times or tell the story and kind of help me figure out what's happening in the shoulder. Uh, we'll use the imaging, x-ray, MRI, CT scan to kind of complete that story and then we'll come up with a treatment plan. Uh, there are many things, but uh, the correctly indicated surgery, so doing the right surgery for the right reason can really be helpful in getting people back to where they want to be with their shoulders. So thank you again for your time and uh, we'll uh, take some questions. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Davis. So we'll get started with the questions that are in the chat box here. Um, all right, so first question, um, is playing golf inherently bad for your shoulder? Please say no. Uh, no, I, I will absolutely say no. Um, I'm a big golfer too, so I would hope not. Actually, I find that a lot of people, with, even with really bad shoulder problems, rotator cuff tears or arthritis, and they come in and they say, you know, doing other activities bother them, and everyone always is surprised that they're still actually able to play golf, um, even despite them having like a really arthritic shoulder or something like that. Uh, and the reason I think for that, you know, if, as long as you're swinging the club appropriately, your arm isn't really getting way up high overhead, which is generally the time when shoulder problems start to bother people more. Now, that being said, you know, some severe problems, people can't play golf at all. 
I have seen some people who have injured their shoulders playing golf, but you know, that can happen doing anything. Um, so no, I don't think it's inherently bad for it. And many times with all these operations that I talked about here, um, pretty much all of them, really all of them, we can get back, if people are avid golfers, we can get them back on the course. Okay, does any hand injury cause pain in shoulder due to limited functional use of that extremity? Um, you know, I mean, it certainly could, depending on, on the injury. Um, you know, all of our joints are connected. Everything kind of has, has to do with one another. So if you have an injury in one, one part of your body where you're having to reposition or use your arm, in kind of a not normal biomechanical way uh, that can definitely throw off the normal biomechanics and, and cause pain. So if you're having to do something, um, an example that I, that I see all the time, it's not a hand, but people all, all the time come in with describing neck pain up here. Um, and that's something we call compensatory pain in the, in the trapezius, if, which is your muscle back up here, you have your trap, people might know it as. You know, if you're raising your arm and your shoulder isn't working normally, people have a tendency to hitch their shoulder blade up. And that really uses your, tra your trapezius muscle more than it's intended to be used, which is more as just a stabilizer of the shoulder blade. And then people get all this soreness in the trapezius because they're constantly lifting it up. Um, so, you know, that's an example of a shoulder problem causing a neck problem. So yes, I mean, there are always adjacent joints that can cause problems um, in those next to them. Okay, next question. Seems like with the body, a knee injury can cause pain in the hip due to overcompensation, which can then cause pain in the back. Is the shoulder independent of other injuries in the body or can shoulder pain be connected as well? Yeah, so very similar question. It can definitely be connected. Um, you know, we, uh, another example of this is uh, spine surgeons uh, frequently talk of adjacent segment disease. So you might get degenerative disc disease you know, between your L5 and S1, and then it gets fixed surgically. And then two years later, you have a problem at L4, L5. And that's something we call adjacent segment disease, where all of a sudden you're, you're having more motion at that L4, 5 because the L5, 1 is fused. Um, and, and some of the spine surgeons like to point out that it's similar in, you know, other joints in the body. So the hip or knee, like you talked about, if, you know, if you're having hip pain, it can refer to the knee, or if you fix the hip and it's moving better then you're using the knee more and it causes more pain so that can definitely happen in the shoulder um, it can cause neck pain or if you're having you know if the shoulder starts feeling better again and then you're using it more then it might cause pain somewhere else another common thing that we see is you know if somebody is recovering from a shoulder surgery or or kind of resting a shoulder from an injury and then they're using the other arm more, you might get more pain on that side just from overuse there. So it's always, those are always things to be cognizant of. And yeah, I mean, everything is connected and can have a reason for that. Okay, so next question. What home exercises with dumbbells do you recommend for strengthening the shoulder and rotator cuff? Is bench press with leverage machine and hands held parallel to each other okay? Um, so it's a good question. Uh, I think, you know, as long as you're doing things safely, that's definitely okay to do. Um, as far as dumbbells and rotator cuff, you want to use something really light. Uh, even if you get some some TheraBands, and that's what it, you, we saw those in the pictures um, that I showed for therapy, that can be really helpful for the rotator cuff. Because what you have to think about is the rotator cuff muscles are very small. So small muscles don't need big weights. Small mus muscles need small weights. And so doing exercises where you know, your elbows at your side, I don't know, let me turn my, let's see if I can see myself. Um, your elbow by your side, rotating out like this, that's gonna help with your external rotators, your rotator cuff, pulling down uh, helps with your uh, lat and other muscles around the shoulder. But things that I always tell people uh, to be cognizant of when they're doing, especially free weights and dumbbells, because you don't, you sometimes can lose control of them. Obviously, start with light weights that you feel very comfortable with. Um, you should be able to do like 15 reps where the last rep is just as easy as the first, so you're really not overdoing it. And then when we talk about any pressing or over, overhead or bench pressing activities, what I always tell people, you want to make sure that your shoulder is kind of staying in front of your body. So your shoulder blade sits at an angle about 20 degrees off of the normal plane of your body. 
So you want your arm at least to be in that plane, if not in front of it. You don't want it to be back like this. That's what starts to cause pain and problems in the shoulder, especially when you load it with weights. So if you're doing overhead presses, you want to be having your arms more in front and pressing up overhead like this. And then another thing is you don't want to come way down like this with the weight and then push up because that again puts a lot of strain on the shoulder. When you come down with the press, you want to be about level with uh, your elbow level with the ground and then go back up instead of coming all the way down like this. And then similar bench press or any chest press exercises, you want to push forward but not come all the way deep back like this. If you do, keep your arms in really close to your body and then push away. That's going to take less uh, strain on the shoulder. But a lot of times if you just stop here, kind of pretend like you're doing or even do bench press on the floor. So the arm kind of stops when it hits the floor and then go back up. Okay, next question. Are there activity restrictions after a shoulder replacement? I am a 65 year old male who is pretty active physically. Um, not really. The, the most restrictions that I put on people are people who are really heavy weightlifters. Um, so I tell people even after they've had a shoulder replacement, they can continue to lift weights, but it's more, we're talking about, um, you know, just general health maintenance weightlifting relatively light, nothing really heavy. Uh, the, the thing that we have concern about is if you do, if you're a real big weightlifter and doing, you know, 100 or, you know, 200 pound bench presses or more, what you're going to do is you put a lot of stress between that metal ball and that plastic socket, and you can actually wear through that plastic socket. Because the thing we worry about is that plastic, as the shoulder continues to work and work and work, thins out over time. Um, and so you can, I mean, if you're a really, really big weightlifter, lift doing heavy bench presses, you can actually wear through that plastic in a matter of a couple of years. You definitely won't want to do that. Um, but if you're just talking about general, you know, health maintenance uh, working out, there's really no restrictions on it. Um, another kind of heavy duty act activity that some people do, especially around here this time of year, chopping wood, um, that's a pretty big strain on the shoulder. So I would probably avoid something like that. But if you're just talking about general activities, riding a bike, playing tennis, playing golf, um, light weight lifting, things like that, uh, most, you can do most any of that after a shoulder replacement. Okay, next question. Does Tai Chi help arthritis or rotator cuff problems? Um, I'm sure it does. You know, I'm not terribly familiar with Tai Chi, but I imagine, you know, have, from what I've seen of it, the, you know, you're working on very gentle coordinated range of motion exercises. So I think that that would help with that. Um, I didn't touch into this too much as far as therapy or exercises like that for arthritis. It can certainly be helpful. I don't generally prescribe formal physical therapy for arthritis because I find, again, similar to a frozen shoulder, if you're having somebody force you through a range of motion that your shoulder really doesn't want to go through because of the pathology, um, it's only going to cause more pain. So I will tell people to use their shoulder as they feel comfortable. I'll give them some gentle stretching exercises to work on just to keep as much range of motion as they can. So doing something like Tai Chi um, certainly could help. And similarly for a rotator cuff, I think, yeah, and, and you know, anytime you're, you're moving the shoulder, doing some gentle strength, strengthening and stretching and keeping in a good plane, that that's going to potentially help. Okay, next question. I have right shoulder soreness and weakness from time to time. Can lifting weights for strength be helpful? It can. Uh, you want to do it, you know, it depends how sore it is, how weak you are. Um, you know, if, you have an, if you're having a lot of weakness, a lot of difficulty raising your arm or anything like that, it might be something that you want to get looked at uh, to make sure that you don't have a rotator cuff tear or anything like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, like we talked about doing these physical therapy exercises can definitely be helpful for strengthening um, your musculature and keeping things coordinated. But again, you know, a lot of times, depending on how long people have been having symptoms um, and depending on what their exam looks like, I might get, you know, many times the advanced imaging like MRI or CT are things that I hold off until I think that we're going to be scheduling an operation or at least ruling that out. But if it's something that's been going on a long time, I will get an MRI, again, to rule out a rotator cuff injury because you don't want to um, just kind of sit on it and, and keep trying therapy over and over again if the things aren't getting better 
you know, that's when we get that more advanced imaging to look into these problems to see if there's something that maybe a surgery would help with. Oop, I think you're on mute. About that. Okay. My Rothman doc says I have a lot of arthritis in both shoulders and saying I should consider getting it cleaned out. How long is recovery for that? Also, what exercises um, can you do when you have arthritis? Um, so kind of tough to answer that question without looking at the imaging and everything. Um, and like I talked about cleaning out, not a huge fan of that term because it is kind of general. I don't know exactly what that means. Different people can have different explanations for that. Um, and it depends on how bad your arthritis is. So when I talked about the arthroscopic option for arthritis, that debridement procedure or the quote unquote cleaning out, um, there are certain thresholds that I look at uh, for people who would benefit from that and not. So like I talked about, if somebody's in their 40s, 50s and has very mild arthritis, they might be of benefit to that. But it depends if you, and, and this has been borne out in studies, if you have a lot of loss of your joint space, uh, a, a clean out procedure is probably not going to help a whole lot um, because the arthritis is so bad that even if you go in there with an arthroscope and, and shave down loose cartilage and loose you know, labrum and do a biceps tenodesis and release capsule and all these different things that we do, uh, you still might have pain afterwards because if you're bone on bone or close to it, you're still going to be those bony surfaces are still going to be rubbing against one, one each other and causing pain. So that's where, you know, looking at the x-ray is helpful for me giving a better answer to that question. Um, if it is indicated and that, and that's the procedure, the recovery is actually not that bad uh, because we're not really repairing anything. We're more debriding uh, tissue. The biggest thing for me is I usually do that biceps tenodesis like we talked about. Uh, that does need to heal so that your biceps doesn't totally pull down your arm which takes about six weeks. So usually I will have people rest in a sling for about two weeks. After two weeks, we'll start range of motion exercises to get your full motion back. Uh, you do that for about four weeks. And by six weeks, you're pretty good to slowly start to return to your normal activities. Um, and then exercises for when you do have arthritis. Again, I don't generally do recommend Formal therapy, just because pushing on it can sometimes be more painful, but gentle stretch, stretching exercises in all three planes. Again, so that's forward elevation, external rotation, and internal rotation. So you can do things like stretch your arm up overhead or table glides where you lean on it, put your arm on a table and lean forward can help that overhead stretching, keeping your elbow by your side and stretching the arm out to the side. And then internal rotation, something called a sleeper stretch, where you put your arm like this and just gently stretch it this way, or bringing it up behind your back with a towel with your other arm and kind of pulling it up the back. And so doing stretches in those three planes can, um, can help kind of stretch things out and make it feel a little better. Dr. Davis, um, can, would you mind stopping to share your screen so that if you're doing anything with hand motions, we can see it? Oh, yeah, sorry. Can, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. I should have made note of that sorry. sooner. Okay, so next question. I'm scheduled for surgery in February for shoulder replacement. When I was at the doctor's, I had radiating pain and he scheduled me to see a physiatrist. Does having spine issues affect the shoulder? Um, so it's very common to see problems between the neck and the shoulder uh, causing pain. So uh, neck pain, and it's very common for, for people to come in saying they have shoulder pain and then after, we do the exam and the history and everything, we determine it's actually more coming from the neck. So problems that people will feel in the shoulder that are coming from the neck are usually more in the back of the shoulder. So as we talked about before, like rotator cuff problems are usually, usually on the side. Labral problems or arthritis, you usually feel kind of deep within the shoulder. But if you're having pain coming from the neck down around the back of the shoulder, and especially if it radiates all the way down your arm into your hand, and you're having any numbness and tingling, that's usually more of a sign of a pinched nerve, quote unquote, in the neck, which is really um, either arthritis or a disc herniation in the neck that's pushing on the nerves that come out of the neck and, and then come down your arm. And so that's very common to have that happen. And, uh, you know, so, and it is sometimes difficult to, to parse out between the two. So frequently, yeah, we will have people evaluated by our neck specialist too, just to make sure that there's not a neck problem going on. 
Now you certainly can have both. You can have a neck problem and a shoulder problem and having symptoms from the two can kind of over, over lie on the shoulder. And I frequently work uh, together with my, my spine and my physiatry colleagues to try and uh, parse out those differences in their patients. Okay, is there a standard exercise set designed to properly exercise all typical age-related joint and muscle problems? Um, as it relates uh, to the shoulder, I mean, I would say the things we talked about before, kind of those healthy lifting uh, exercises and focusing um, on keeping your, you know, your arms in front of you as you're doing overhead and pressing exercises, but also like rows are very helpful for the shoulder. Focusing on your, your scapular, the scapular stabilization exercises, so kind of pinching your shoulder blades back, pulling them down, and then doing these kind of, you know, rotational exercises are good for the rotator cuff. Um, so those are kind of the general exercises that I'll give patients um, if I just want them to do, you know, a home therapy program, especially now in the time of the pandemic, a lot of people and even before when therapy wasn't open, we were doing a lot more home therapy. Um, and that's something that, um, that, yeah, we definitely do a lot of. Okay, so sleeping with your arms crossed above your head leads to shoulder problems. Is that true? Um, no, I would not say that. I would say that if you have a shoulder problem, it might be uncomfortable to sleep in that position. So I would kind of flip it around. Um, so, you know, sleep how you feel comfortable sleeping. But if I find that when people do have a problem with their shoulder, and then I think the example maybe is referring to is when I was talking about frozen shoulder, is that people can have a very difficult time sleeping because the arm just doesn't want to go in a position where they might normally sleep in. And then so it can cause pain. Uh, kind of in addition to that is trouble sleeping at night is a very common complaint that I hear with people that have shoulder problems, especially if they lie more sleeping on their back. Because what happens is you lay down and your shoulders kind of drop down backwards. And that puts them in that position that I was talking about where you don't want to be in, where you're kind of stretched back like this and people get a lot of pain. So if that is something that's bothering you, something you can try, if you're comfortable sleeping on your back, you know, some people are side sleepers or belly sleepers, so it's kind of dependent. But if you prop up under your shoulder blade and your arm, so your arm is kind of in this more neutral rested position up front, that might be a more comfortable position in to sleep. But again, I don't think that sleeping with your arms overhead is necessarily gonna cause shoulder problems, no. Okay, so speaking uh, or tagging on to the sh frozen shoulder issue, the next question is related to that. Um, the patient says, I had a frozen right shoulder seven years ago, it took about 18 months to resolve. Now suffering with left frozen shoulder going on for almost a year. Feel like I am still in the frozen stage. Because I experienced this in both shoulders now, do you think this could be related to genetics or the autoimmune issues you mentioned? I'm not diabetic nor pre-diabetic and my thyroid has tested normal. Do you think I could experience this issue again in either the shoulder or both shoulders? So, um, I mean, if you've been tested for your thyroid and, and, your, um, and diabetes, I would say you probably don't have that if that's been the case. Um, but like I said, it's not exclusive to people that have those problems and having it on both shoulders. I didn't mention this. If you get, if you get frozen shoulder on one side, even if you don't have one of these, um, other, uh, diagnoses, you are more likely to get it in the other shoulder. And again, you know, we can't predict if and when that'll ever happen. But if you are somebody who's prone to get a frozen shoulder, if you get it on one side, you you might, you have a higher chance than the general population of getting it on the other side. Um, <clears throat> and like you experienced on your right shoulder, taking 18 months to resolve. Again, that's unfortunately not uncommon. Um, and it is something that can be extremely frustrating and difficult to deal with. And like I said, if, if it does get to that year point and people are really, really frustrated and the motion's not getting any better, that is a time that we can consider a surgical uh, intervention for it to get your range motion back and just get you moving forward. But it's certainly not something you have to do. I've had people who have had frozen shoulder that's taken two years or even more to recover, and they just really didn't want to have surgery and wanted to just wait it out, which is certainly a reasonable option to do. Um, once you have it, you know, on one shoulder, are you going to get it again? It's hard to say for sure. Um, I would say the likelihood is a little less, but, you know, any, obviously anything can happen. 
Okay, so we're running out of time here. We have three quick questions left. Um, is it better to sleep in a firm mattress for a side sleeper? Um, I would say whatever you know you're most comfortable with. I guess it depends on how you put your arm when you sleep on the side, if it's tucked in or if it's kind of up in this position. Um, but you know, sometimes getting pillows to to help uh, protect the arm if the shoulder is causing you problems sleeping in that position. Okay, uh, playing tennis, any concerns with serving overhead? Uh, nope, I would just say as long as you are warming up appropriately, doing stretches beforehand, even maybe doing some gentle um, like band work just to kind of get the shoulder feeling good, uh, warmed up and ready to go. And as long as you're, you know, being within your, your comfort level and not really trying to kill it like Fredder, you're probably going to be okay. All right, and final question for today. Do you recommend second opinions? Do your doctor share MRI results, et cetera, and get their colleagues' opinions? Uh, yeah, we do it all the time. Um, I will frequently tell patients, you know, if they're uncomfortable with, or if they you know, want to get more information on it, I will happily refer them for a second opinion. Or if they want to go outside of um, our practice and get a second opinion, they're always welcome to do that. In our practice, the way we work it is if somebody calls and says they wanted a second opinion, you know, from me or about my, what I've recommended, usually um, the, we'll, the, our office will reach out to both physicians being involved and make sure that we're okay with it. I know in, in the shoulder and elbow service that we are always okay with that. And then do we get colleagues' opinions? Yes. And so that's, I think, one of the great benefits of working at the Rothman Institute and having trained here is that for my division anyway in shoulder and elbow, I am working with some of the world's experts. Um, and I, we have a weekly conference with our fellows and with all of uh, the other attendings on our service. And many times we'll have what we call interesting case conference. So we will present more challenging cases, but even outside of that, if there are cases, and even some of my more senior partners will have problems that they wanna bounce off each other and they'll present the cases there. And it really, um, I think, adds to our ability to provide the best patient care that we can. All right, Dr. Davis. Well, thank you so much for all the information. I hope it was um, valuable for all the attendees. And like I said, we are recording this session, so I will be sending out uh, the video to all the attendees. And um, we hope that you have a safe uh, holiday season. And again, Dr. Davis, thank you so much. That was extremely informative. A lot of comments are coming through saying it was an excellent presentation, so thank you. Great, thanks everyone for your time. And thank you, Janine, for helping to set it all up. Yeah, happy to do so. Thanks everyone for your time. All right, take care.